Nelson, I'm really excited to speak again and always excited when there's a new book that comes out. How have you been and you know what's going on with this new project for younger people? Yeah, thanks for having me. First of all, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, yeah, last time we talked, uh, I, my last book came out. Um, I've basically taken that uh, or the, the main concepts of that and rewritten it in a form that's a little more palatable for kind of the grade school age, kind of uh, 10 to 14 year olds, but not limited to that. But um, just in a way that's super school kind of focused. Uh, in a way that kids would uh, kind of soak it up a little more. Right, right. I mean, it's it's incredible. It's super visual and so adventure based. Um, and I'm right. glad that you did it because I mean, I remember getting a copy of this one. I forgot something. Oh, you have that one. And wow, uh, yeah. This is this is really amazing. Uh, but Thank now you. you've taken it to like this. Is it a is it a different grade level the the two books i i couldn't really tell i was trying to imagine myself at different ages and i was thinking is this grade five is this grade six you know compared to the earlier one, yeah. which maybe is a little bit earlier it's tough to to decide like who you're writing for because you know different even at that those ages like kids read at different levels but um you know and honestly i I enjoy reading that book. Uh, people, adults I've given it to have enjoyed reading it. So it's not just for the age, but I think there's elements in it that are just super silly and, um, you know, out there that I think uh, any young kid would, would, would like to read about. And yeah, was, I mean, superpowers are for everybody, right? <laughs> At any age. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's called memory superpowers. So superpowers is kind of like a catchy title for a kid to right, right. say, Hey, I want, I want that. So when we, when we think about this, one of the things that just leaps out at me, and not to get super granular about one sentence, but <laughs> it seems really interesting that you, you correct yourself right away. You say, you know, welcome reader, or I mean, you know, should I say explorer? I think explorer is the word you use. And um, yeah. that seems to be really, really important, especially given how we learn memory techniques. It's so why did you choose to, uh, to to make that little correction in your first sentence or switch paths there from reader? To yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you, you no, noticing that because, you know, I wanted to kind of from the get-go show that this is, you're, you're in, like the re, as the reader, you're involved in this journey from the start of the book to the end. And, you know, they may be too young to, to kind of understand the the broader kind of, metaphor that's going on but memory techniques are all about storytelling in my eyes and and kind of this journey um you know the journey method of the memory palace is all based on kind of starting somewhere and ending somewhere and putting all the visuals that you want to remember along the way so if i kind of frame the book as its own journey um and memory journey palace whatever or exploring um uh, exploration that it would be in itself memorable, you know? Yeah. 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 I think it, it, it's amazing. I don't want to give too much away, but there are regions to visit and, you know, there's a uh, different yeah. aspects of one's character that you invite to bring out. And of course yeah. with the, with the visuals that it's a very immersive experience. Thank you. Yeah. As a kid, you know, I always loved books that took you to kind of like those, themed places you know you like there's like an ocean kind of themed place like even like video games you know there's always like an ocean world there's like a snow world there's like a, a forest world you know like i always love feeling out those places because they were super memorable you know and they kind of like contain you know memories and information about what's there you know so i try to emulate that and and you know, put some of the memory techniques in different chapters that are focused on these kind of different locations. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because you, you have numerous suggestions for ways to make games out of using the techniques and learning them through a, through a sort of game thing. And, you know, it seems to me that this is, this is something that a lot of people do naturally, but other people just don't know how to do naturally. They, they don't know yeah. how to in, in, inject or, add a fun element just on their own. So, you know, were you conscious of, of that need for people or uh, was it just? Yeah. I mean, 
I, a lot of people who I coach who are older, that's one of the first things they'll say to me is like, oh, wow, you're very creative. I wouldn't have come up with when I, when I'm kind of walking them through an example, they'd be like, I would have never come up with that example. I'm not that creative. And I, I say to them like, well, you know, it's something I've worked on too. It's not something that I necessarily naturally was good at. Um, and I actually, sometimes I hear other people's mnemonics or imagery and I'm like, wow, that's really good. I didn't, I couldn't have come up with that either. But, um, you know, something I worked on. And I think the great thing about kids is that they have no filter. They, they don't, you know, nobody, or they have at least less of this, of people having told them their whole life that they should conform to a certain thought process, right? They're a little more moldable at that point. So being able to think freely about silly stuff with no bounds um, is more up their alley. So um, I wanted to play to that as much as possible in this book. And, um, and yeah, so I'm basically just encouraging them to join me on this wild ride and let their imagination kind of go free, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think it's so interesting too, because there's certain dialogue elements that you have in there. And again, this might be just granular focus and noticing things that, uh, you know, don't, don't play, but I just coincidentally had read, uh, Scott Gosnell's translation of Bruno's song of Circe, um, and a new translation he put together of on the composition of images. And I was thinking more and more and asking him about, you know, the dialogue form and it is so I immersive and, and allows people to sort of think it through an external view as if they're, you know, imagining these multiple sorts of characters. So I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Have you, have you read Bruno or have you read some of those ancient books where they have the memory training in dialogue form? No, I've never, no, I have not. Uh, right. But I'm, I'm intrigued now. Um, Cause yeah, that, I, I don't think I um, put that in there on purpose, but now that I think about it, yeah, a lot of that, maybe that came naturally like, okay, if I can insert some dialogue here that would, would kind of enhance the, or encourage the, the, you know, imagination to kind of, come out and then have them imagine these two characters kind of exchanging um, throughout the book. But yeah, it's an interesting thought. I had never kind of purposefully thought about it, you know? Right, right. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, creativity. And I often think about how it's the opposite in memory training, which is not to say that you're not creative, but you're almost seizing upon things that already exist rather than inventing lots of new things. So I often use this term sure. mental Lego and it's almost, and I was thinking of that where you're giving numerous examples of what you could use for associations and that they tend to be, you know, not like inventing the idea of a uh, boomerang, for example, for seven, but there is a thing called boomerangs and it just happens that boomerangs were used to throw at kangaroos. So, you know, it, it makes sense for uh, seven in some sense, if you're going to use that style of the, of the major. So, uh, All right. I'm just thinking like, is it, is it really being creative or is it kind of like playing mental Lego? Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, even when you think about like the more advanced techniques that some of us memory athletes have is for numbers, you know, like we have a fixed image for every possible two digit or three digit number. And then we're just placing them, you know, like Legos around uh, on certain locations. But I still think that there is a bit of, yeah, I guess it's not complete creative freedom, but you do still have to, I think, have to be creative with when you put the Lego blocks on or together, um, you kind of have to like massage it a little bit with, with some um, creative sauce, let's say. Right, right, right. Um, but you're right. Yeah. It's maybe not the ultimate, um, creative freedom. But I think when you start, um, I think it's important to try to make your creative side come out as much as possible, because that's, in my mind, what's going to make it very sticky and memorable at first. Right, right. Uh, well, one thing that, that there's this laugh out loud moment, and again, I don't want to give too much away, but I think there's a good question uh, that'll help people out of it, where you, you talk about how boring it is or how boring it would be to sit there and read the back of a shampoo bottle. But isn't that what so many people 
come to memory techniques for is to deal with the fact that they do have to memorize information that is as boring as the back of the <laughs> shampoo bottle. And I want to cross index this with a thing that you, you do that I think is, is sort of allowed by your character and the fantasy sort of elements of the book, or it's not really fantasy, but adventure and ex exploration is that you point out, this is going to be a long and hard adventure, which you normally you know, you know, don't get away with in a memory book. You've got to be like, this is so easy, and this is going to be, you know, laser fast and fun and so forth. But um, so I wonder, you know, how do we deal with the fact that a lot of information is that dry and boring? And then is that sort of, um, this is going to be a long and hard adventure? Is that just playing to the to the genre, so to speak? Or is that more coming from your sports or a perf like performance background with climbing and, uh, and, and that sort of stuff? Where in that world, we know from research that coaches will find that people do respond better to this kind of this is going to be the hardest training today and you're going to work your butt off and like all that sort of stuff. So I'm just sort of wondering where you place all that stuff. And then how can people adapt that mental model so that shampoo bottles aren't so boring? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I came from it, like you said, more of like the, the coaching side of things. Um, Cause I think I follow that up when I say it's going to be very difficult. Be like, I'm like, don't worry though. I'm with you. Like I'm your, there's the character there is a, is a guide, is a, is a, men, a mentor to you as the reader. So while I try to make it sound like it's challenging, I also say, you know, it's going to be fine. I'm with you and I'm going to teach you everything along the way. Um, Cause I do think it is important to, yes, the techniques can make things, you know, super fast, laser sharp, whatever. But I, I often sometimes hate when, you know, memory teachers say that because it's such an easy hook and it's not the whole story. You know, you, there is a lot of work involved in getting, a, a strong memory. Um, maybe not so much work, but dedication, right? So you got to be in consistency, uh, working on it in little bits every day, you don't have to spend hours, but just a little bit. And that's really what I'm saying is like, it's a long journey in the sense that like, you've now introduced this into your life and you got to kind of stick with it if you want to see the results. Right. Um, it's not too hard if you do that, but um, the hard part is sticking to that. And um yeah, in terms of the shampoo bottle, it's funny that I, I used to love that line and, and I still did when I put it in the book, but I don't know if you've ever read the back of a, um Old Spice shampoo bottle though, have you? I, if, I, if I have old, read Old Spice specifically, I don't remember. <laughs> because the newer ones, they have these weird commercials, right, that right. I think are pretty good. Like It's kind of some of the stuff I kind of see in my memory palaces. It's so bizarre. But their, their shampoo bottles, actually, if you ever read them, are hilarious and super memorable. And I've actually read some of those recently and been like, I should change what I said about shampoo bottles because these guys rewrote that uh, narrative. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, as you know, with, with memory techniques, you know, you take – the goal is for most people to take the dry and difficult, everyday, mundane stuff that you need to memorize but just can't – get it to stick and make it um, not so boring and, and dry. And, and yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, I just tried to choose an example by saying a back of a shampoo bottle to try to think of the most dry, readable thing out there, you know, right, right. there's probably something more boring than that, but that came to mind. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I unfortunately have to read them myself uh, re recently because, uh, you know, I'm getting not older at, at per se, but starting to have all these weird health things. And it's just like, is it a toxin in this bottle? And, you know, <laughs> and I, I'm doing gene analysis and like it's, you know, ABC G8 gene and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, it is even myself. I have to remind myself, no, this can be fun. <laughs> this can be exciting. And uh, so far, right. so... It, it is a it is a concern and it can be overwhelming. Um, in terms of the uh, well, I want to talk about the alphabet and okay. The reason why I want to talk about it is because it seems to me the most obvious thing in the world. But over the years, I've heard nothing but complaints or mystery uh, about the alphabet. And lo and behold, I just love to see in your book not only the alphabet but it taught really really well um thank you and so 
what is it with the alphabet? Like, have you encountered this as well? Like endless either complaints about it or just mystery about why the alphabet? Because it just seems to me the most obvious thing under the sun, given the nature of language, to uh, create pegs out of it. Yeah, I've argued that too. And I, especially with kids, you know, you think of, I don't know how it is where you're from, but in the US, you go to any kindergarten and it's plastered with the alphabets and some little picture of what a word it, that starts with that letter. You know, you have mm. little A, capital A, and then a little apple. And you have little B, big B, and maybe a banana or a baseball bat or something. And it's like kids who, um, you know, are looking at that all day and learning the alphabet can make those associations almost breathlessly. You know, it's like A is for apple. Like that's automatic to them because that's how it's taught. So I, I feel like they're the perfect candidates for, um, you know, starting with a, a peg method, you know, right. it's so funny. I, my kid is two years old and at the beginning of, of COVID, we gave him, um, we got him an Elmo kind of like suitcase that has all the letters that you can pull out. And underneath it is a little picture. Some of them are characters from Sesame street. Some of them are objects like, um, you know, G is for Grover, the character. And then like F is a football. Um, Y is a yo-yo. And it's so crazy how he, he I, we practice with him a lot. So he, he actually can recognize all the letters at this point, but sometimes I show him a Y and he'll say yo-yo, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, or he, he sees a U and he's like, oh, it's umbrella. Or he'll, sometimes you'll even see the object in real life, like a football and he'll say F, you know? Um, which I, I, you know, I don't think he really understands fully what letters mean in terms of a, a word, but he knows the association. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I'm drooling over that because it's like he's got this this peg system just like already built into him. <laughs> he just needs to be a little bit older, and I can start to kind of play around with that. Um, and that's what I feel like for for grade school kids and even younger, like why not start with that um, as you're learning the alphabet? You start teaching them these mnemonic tools that are going to be just a tiny step uh, more difficult, but, but not hard at all, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm on, I'm on your team with that. I think <laughs> it's, it's such an easy thing to start with for kids. Right. Right. Well, if, if adults are listening to this, I highly recommend memory superpowers because it'll change your mind about, uh, about the alphabet. It's super, super amazing. And it's, it's, it has been for thousands of years. I mean, the, the the gematria, which is the linking of alphabet with numbers, is is how Hebrew is constructed, for example, um, really? etc. So, yeah, if huh. if people are interested, look up the gematria. It's it's ancient. This this sort of idea of uh, the alphabet as a mnemonic system with images, like every alpha elf, every Hebrew letter is linked to some kind of animal or something, um, wow. and an, and a number at the same time. So it's a, uh, you are, you are the, like, you know, everything about the history of techniques. I, I feel partially somewhat embarrassed that I don't know more about the history of the stuff that I teach, but well, as you know, um, it's not necessary. And I think you're being very kind. And I think the, the, the pleasure is, is that I don't know everything. And it just, it astonishes me how every day there's some new angle to follow because <laughs> it is that ancient and that, that rich in the history. And there are yeah. new books well, we, being discovered all the time from the past. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing that opened my eyes was, was uh, I'm sure you've read it, uh, Lynn Kelly's um, books about these techniques historically. Like, I always go to that story about Simonides, the Greeks, but that's not it. That's not the only example. Right. Um, and it was fascinating to read. Like, it opened my eyes. I literally had never heard of any of these other civilizations using these techniques like she described. It's incredible. Well, it is. I mean, I feel that the history is important to promote, even though it's not necessarily necessary. But you will have certain ideas that come to your mind the more that you know about it. So, for example, you talk about um, using the body as a memory palace. And the instant mm -hmm. thing that I think about is... Well, Bruno had these nested memory palaces. And one of the ways that a nested memory palace would work is not just using the body, but inside of a memory palace, you would then place bodies that are themselves memory palaces. And there may even be memory palaces inside of those bodies. So like a <laughs> hand can hold 
an entire solar system, for example, and you just sort of zoom in and here's Venus and here's right. Mars, etc. You could even have the houses of the moon inside of that as individual memory pals. So, I mean, I see this instantly when you're talking about, oh yeah, use the body and you give a great instruction on that. But do you ever, have you ever played around with that? This kind of interlocking nested series of memory palaces inside of memory palaces? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, for, for kind of bigger projects that I, I'm working on, I'm working on one right now, memor having to memorize a really, really big number. And I've broken it down into sections of, of a thousand digits. And basically I have a massive memory palace that is made up of sub memory palaces. And, um, you know, as I keep adding more, more digits, I have to kind of plan for where I'm going to put the next ones. And, one thing that I, I'm actually planning on doing this quite soon is to start using some of these, um, these video games that have like, um, you know, kind of like a lobby where you, where you like explore and then you go into like different levels. Right. And you can use obviously the, 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 the basic lobby area as kind of the higher level memory palace, but then each sub level that is a world of its own, you know, now becomes its own memory palace. I think those kinds of, structures are, are absolutely fascinating and almost seems like you can put an infinite amount of stuff in if you if you use it right you know right right do you ever uh in your gathering of memory palaces sort of teleport or have wormholes or hyperlinks where things connect and you just sort of zoom over or how do you how do you experience the movement through your memory palaces yeah so uh, someone was asking me that last night like how do i where am I? Like, how am I filming it? I guess as I pass through it, and I realize I'm—it's not first person. I'm kind of like a like a security camera in the top kind of angle, angled down, and I just kind of like hover as I watch, you know, um, those locations. And most of them are super seamlessly connected. It's a, a very smooth path, but yeah, some places I have no choice but I have to jump. Um, you know, from here to like some other room through a wall or in another com uh, completely different location. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's it's kind of a above at an angle overview of of, of the locations. Right, right. What what do you do? How, what do you, how do you see it for you? Well, actually, inspired by a, a conversation we had years ago, somehow I'm sure it came from you. Uh, at least okay. it does in my memory there was this word that it's like a constellation, like every loci or, or you know, whatever um, station or however you want to call it, every spot is like a star in a constellation. And it's kind of, you know, moving there. Anyway, somehow that came out of a conversation with us. And so I worked on this. And instead of actually visualizing a memory palace, which I don't really see images anyway, I just sort of started to think about not it's not really like teleportation but it's just sort of like zoom 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 and and kind of just being there with that particular spot as opposed to moving to it um and that uh, sort of brings me to another question i th i don't think kids that i don't think kids uh, would 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 get lost in the weeds with this but i know a lot of adults do which is you know how are you going to remember all these journeys isn't going to be overwhelming and aren't you memorizing two things at once and, you know, overburdening yourself. Right. Um, so how do you, how do you make it? So it's just a, a no brainer, uh, journey. Cause I just don't, I only just choose things that I'm not, I already know that I, that, like, there's nothing to think about, you know, but do you have any yeah. sort of, uh, best practices? Yeah. I mean, I've met a guy, I talk, I give a kind of private coaching to him and, and he had done a bit of work already on memory palaces and he was showing me his collection and they were I was shocked that this even worked for him, but he had drawn rooms on paper that were just an overhead block, like a, a bird's eye view of a square room divided into nine sections, you know, like, like a three by three um, grid. And he just put nine items in each room. And I was like, how do you tell them apart? How do you remember what's what? And he was like, you know, I never thought about that. Maybe uh, I should work on that. Uh, I was like, yeah, I mean, for me, I always teach it as, I, and that's why I like to use the word journey because um, 
you know, we remember spaces very well, but also I think the story that goes along with those spaces, like how you navigate through it. Um, you know, when you think of your house, it's a lot easier to think of and more natural if you just think about it going through it as if you were walking through it, giving a tour, you know, like starting at the front door and ending up in the bedroom or something. Um, so yeah, I, I really try to tell people this step should not be the hard part. This should be super easy, as easy as possible. And to make it as easy as possible, you want to use something that um, just, you know, um, I will say though, that like for a big project, like the one I was just mentioning, I have to come up with a lot of journeys and locations and those, you know, I have to make sure I keep them straight. Some I have to like really think about and decide what, what I'm going to use. And for those, you know, it, it's, it does, it's not too much harder, but I actually will go and write them down. I, I keep track of them in, in Google docs. I have a bunch of lists of them and it really doesn't take much, you know, just a few times through saying, okay, I'm going to start here, stop here, 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 here list. You know, I, I'm aiming to get maybe 200 locations in this one spot and I list them out. I kind of go through them in my head a couple times and it's, it's not like I'm memorizing them or recalling them. It's just kind of like traversing it in the right way. And, and then that's it. Uh, it's, it's there and ready to be used, you know, but I think it works so well is because I'm always using places that I, I'm familiar with to some extent. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's almost key. Although, you know, I've heard from people over the years that they, and you mentioned video games already that they, they can do this. I've never gotten anything more advanced than like a single screen sort of Donkey Kong platform game okay. as, you know, making it super simple on my brain, maybe three, three spots per Kong, <laughs> Donkey Kong layer or whatever. But um, what do you think the future brings for kids who are so screen oriented and so game oriented uh, in a way my generation certainly wasn't? I don't know what, what it was like for you, but, you know, it, it's just strange to me how much time people spend in virtual environments especially when you think about how that your memory is already a virtual environment in some sense. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what I would like to see obviously is people using their memories more, but you know, I think using these flat surfaces, the computer, your, your, your iPhone, um, I think that's really bad for your memory, but some of the stuff I've seen with, uh, I'm looking over here cause I have, um, a virtual uh, reality headset, right. um, which I just got, you know, a few months ago and experienced for the first time, like with a lot of um, focus and, and, and attention. And I realized like this, this stuff has a lot of potential for kind of helping people kind of learn more with memory palaces because suddenly you have a device that can actually bring you to places that you could never go to otherwise. Right or even imagine going to. Um, and to me, that just screams memory palaces, more memory palaces. And the more memory palaces you have, the more locations you have to store stuff. So, um, you know, even the when you put on your, if you have an Oculus, for example, there's like a, you, you, when you turn it on, you're in this kind of living room uh, with your menu and stuff. And it's like, even that room, like before I put on the headset, that place did not exist. I put on the headset and now I have a new memory palace. Right. Suddenly all this potential for, for data to, to, to kind of like put, to be put into my mind just because I put this screen in front of my head in this certain um, fashion that's three dimensional. And that to me blew my mind. And I can only imagine if somebody, I'm, I'm trying to work on this too, but if somebody could develop some kind of memory palace training tool or practice tool with one of those headsets like think of that future man i mean you could have textbooks that are downloadable that are basically just a memory palace set up with the imagery for you and you just explore it right yeah you know i never was able to get through to him to interview him but jaron lanier has a book called dawn of the new everything and he was one of the oh. vr pioneers and he has a oh, section okay. in there on its potential as memory palace uh, tool. Oh, really? Um, so 
you, I think you have more clout than I do. You might be able to get through to him <laughs> to, to have a chat about it because he's, he, Interesting. He, he is the man when it comes to VR for sure. And Dawn of the New Everything is an amazing book about VR. So yeah, I'm going to check that out. Dawn of the New Everything. Yeah. You know, he's, uh, he's been on Sam Harris's podcast, etc., to talk about oh, okay. different things, but nonetheless, and he's got a lot of views on, on media and, you know, being careful around technology, even though he's a huge pioneer of it. So it's quite an interesting <laughs> guy. Um, and you know, when it comes to that kind of realm of experiencing, uh, different environments that you could never access, I mean, that's, that's one of the beautiful things about information period is you get to experience different worlds the more you can remember. And one of the things that I, I, I love when I saw it, because you don't see it that often, you usually see it the opposite. And I, it makes me want to pull my hair out, even though I'm not really an angry person, um, <laughs> which is that you say, it's okay to memorize things without understanding it, because that can be the path to understanding. That's not exactly how you put it. But um, you talk about that problem of understanding and how that mm -hmm. having it in memory can can lead to the insight that you're looking for. And I was just like, yes, thank you, because there's so many people, uh, including other memory experts who we don't have to uh, point out uh, because they mean well, but um, they say, you know, no, no, you should understand it before you commit it to memory. So what, what called you to, to make that critical point that I think you're absolutely correct? I mean, there's so many things I never would have understood if I didn't memorize it first. I just know this from yeah. my own experience. Well, I, I just come at it from the angle that like, if I, if I'm trying to learn something, it exists outside of me, right? It's on Wikipedia. It's in a book. It's in my notes. It's on a, it's on a thing, a physical thing that is not me. Right. Um, I want to get it inside of me. Right. Um, in this thing so that it is, it is part of me and that I don't need to re rely on this outside thing, um, to get it. So memory techniques will do that quickly. Um, and yes, you know, how does this work? Well, the techniques, you know, you're turning it into pictures that sometimes and most often don't have anything to do with what the actual information means um, or, or the deeper context of what it means. But I think that's okay because I love the idea that once I can remove it from that external device and carry it with me, I can do whatever I want with it. You know, I can just learn a little bit more about the data that I, I, I just memorized, or I can go on to master it and learn every facet of it. Um, and I have the control and I don't need to rely on a textbook anymore because it's there. Um, I don't know. I love that feeling. You know, it's like the, the example I always give is with presidents, right? If you're learning the presidents, you know, you can come up with 45 different images for the last name of the president and many of them will be very strange images that maybe remind you of the word or, um, you know, just our cue for the word. And it's like an object that has nothing to do with the president at all. But um, like Eisenhower, I always say the image for that should be a pair of eyeballs in a shower, eyes in the shower, right? right? That's not Eisenhower. All the things Eisenhower did, right? Like nothing is those eyeballs have nothing to do with that. So, but that's okay. So once I have the eyeballs in the shower, you know, in my mind, which is unforgettable, we can then talk about, you know, whatever you want. What was his first name? What were the, were the, the years that he served? What did he do notable, notably in his presidency? Um, what is he doing now? And, and who is his wife? All those kinds of things you can then add to the imagery and, and then start to have discussions about, who he was and pull on those pieces of information to kind of expand your knowledge and connection of ideas about him in your brain. So I, I think deeper knowledge starts with, with, with having a good memory of, of, of the things. Yeah. You maybe get him to uh, use his shampoo bottle as a little mini memory palace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, he's uh, reading the back of the shampoo bottle and his, his body too, for that matter. Mm hmm. Um, so one of the things, I mean, I remember you doing a video about it a long time ago that I thought was just fascinating when I tried it. Cause I was like, no, this is never going to work. But <laughs> this idea of like writing down the first letter of, uh, oh, yeah. of verbatim text. And it's, it's actually astonishing how well that works. Uh, how did, how did you come across that idea? 
I, if uh, there's a, I, I linked the video in my description there, but I learned it from an, another YouTuber actress who I think I was just bored on YouTube one day and, and looked up. I was just curious to check out the landscape. If I, ter- I searched certain how to memorize this and see what's up there. And I think I did how to memorize lines. That one came up and I saw this girl doing this thing where she wrote it in her notebook a couple of times and then said it. Um, and just the first letter she wrote down and, and then it was there. So okay. like you, I tried it and I was like, no way. Yeah, yeah. This is like, <laughs> she's exaggerating, but no, it's, it works. I, you know, nine times out of 10, you get it perfect. And it's, it's pretty insane. So, and, 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 since that video came out, I've heard of a lot of people who comment on my video or who have told me that a lot of actors actually use this technique. Um, some clients that I have that who are actors um, or even people that I've worked on shows with who are full-time actors have said they know one version of this technique or another. Um, I think Rob Lowe was even talking about that technique um, on a podcast recently. Um right. And yeah, I was just fascinated that here was a technique that I never knew about. It doesn't really employ the kind of traditional techniques we talk about, mm. but uh, it's super effective. Yeah, it is. I, would you take it on the stage though for a TEDx or a TED? No. So I think I think the the, the best place for it is like learning short little sections um, and. Even that, I don't know if it's necessarily the best to get it into your long-term memory. I feel like if you, it'll help you learn it quickly, but it may not stay very long. Um, so you may have to like pair it with some kind of memory palace thing if you want to keep it for longer. Yeah, well, that's always the thing, right? We want to keep it for longer, and so you do, you know, make sure to cover the importance of practicing recall and having certain, you know, protocol around that, which is great. But uh, yeah. I feel like there's endless things that we could continue to talk about, and, uh, yeah, for sure. and I, I, I would like to. But uh, I know um, I know time is always fleeting. So, you know, what is as we bring this to uh, a roundabout? What is the number one thing you would impart to parents? Because I I think that this is you know the. the I'm very grateful for this book because parents come to me all the time and ask, and there's very, very few books. I'm, I'm sort of aware of one other that I would recommend for, you know, uh, middle school grades, um, uh, ages. And so now there's, there's, there's this, which I think is, 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 is killer. But what do you, what do you, what do you recommend for the parent who can't get the, the kid motivated or even interested to read a book, no matter what superpowers that it contains, which great title, by the way, cause that's going to be irresistible, but, uh, right. <laughs> you know, let's talk to the parents and, you know, what can they do to, to encourage this if they're not like you already sort of, you know, getting um, uh, an alphabet list going for a, a young right. star, uh, from the get go. Well, I think, you know, it, it starts kind of with what we were talking about just a moment ago that there's this thing in education right now, at least in the U S where memory or memorization is bad. It's just, I don't know, the schools made it seem that way. And, you know, you know, you're looking, so that, that makes parents think that they should find a school where, you know, some, they hear the things like, we're not about memorization, right? We're about learning. And I think that's the dumbest thing that any teacher can say because I think learning starts with memorization. I don't know how you can learn something without any kind of memorization. And even if you do try your best to remove that component of like, you know, having to study something and and regurgitate it from memory, what if you could do that, like I was saying before, really fast and it's not such a big issue. And then you can actually work on the things that help the students like understand them, those concepts, you know, mm. isn't that valuable? Right. Um, I think, yeah, of course, memory sounds kind of boring and dry and maybe that's why they try to shy away from it. But if you look at it through the R lens, uh, how we view memory, I think it would be a totally different um, feel that parents and education system would have about it. Um, the other thing is, is I hope parents understand that having a good memory is something that's with you for life. And if the beginning of our conversation didn't show that, it's I think it's harder for uh, I don't think it's hard, but it's harder for 
adults to to kind of tap into these skills because you know they've gone so long without really being able to freely think in the ways that we're saying and kids are primed for it you know imaginative no barriers whatever like they can do whatever they want and if we can teach it to them early on that's setting them up for life to have these skills at their disposal and i think that stuff is priceless well it is indeed priceless and thank you so much for all that you do in everything books and appearances and all the things that you're doing to help get it into the world how we trying see to get it, it out there <laughs> yeah because yeah, thank um, you I think I think we're we're still in the great memory renaissance that seemed to you know have started what now twenty nine thirty years ago with uh, uh, the, the competitions and etc. and it just seems to be growing and growing and so let's keep going and yeah. thank you so much for being an inspiration and educator and um, constant you know constantly focusing our attention on this and now addressing the younger generation I really appreciate it and I know everyone yeah. listening will too. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're doing, I love how there's a lot of us doing kind of the same thing, but we have our own little pockets of how we're spreading the word. And, um, you know, I have my own little kind of niche, you have yours. And I think all together we're doing a great job kind of growing this, uh, into the mainstream. Yeah. Maybe the next one needs to be called memory Avengers. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. It's exactly, not as yeah. bad now that it came out of my mouth, but you know what I mean? No, no, but you know, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, pleasure talking to you as usual. Thank you, and look forward to the next time.